Is it okay for Bible-based believers, for people that are faith-based, to want to have success, to want to have prosperity, to want to have money? I'm so selfish that I don't even trust God, who owns everything, to give me another opportunity. What a perspective. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. So one of the biggest questions I've always contemplated is the difference between ownership and stewardship, especially coming from a Bible-based perspective about money, I've wrestled with ownership versus stewardship. Let me break this down. What does ownership mean? Let's look at this definition. Ownership is a state or fact of exclusive rights and control over property, which may be an object, land or real estate or an intellectual property. Ownership involves multiple rights collectively referred to as title, which may be separated and held by different parties. Ownership is self-propagating, self-propagating, and that the owner of any property will also own the economic benefits of that property. Now, here's the thing. As Bible-based believers, as folks living a God-centered, faith-based life, we're introduced to this topic called stewardship, especially when it comes to the topic of giving and tithing and making sure that you make the most of the things that have been given to you. So let me define this definition of stewardship. Stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources. The concepts of stewardship can be applied to the environment and nature, economics, health, property, information, and theology. So bottom line, when you're thinking about stewardship, stewardship means that you're basically being entrusted with certain things. It's not yours, but you're being entrusted to it. So I wanna go over this video real quick. My team found this video. Hey Matt, check this out. And we want your reaction. I think many of you want my reaction to as well because based on the comments, we've seen that many of you also wrestle with this topic about stewardship. So let's check out this video. The world has a lot to say about money. It says that money offers success, security, and even significance. Yes, it does. I agree with that. Money is just as important as breathing in this world. Listen, uh, this is a big topic that, uh, a big area, again, wrestling. Is it okay for Bible-based believers, for people that are faith-based, to want to have success, to want to have prosperity, to want to have money? Well, if you're a steward over it, you should be multiplying with what you've been given. So bottom line is, yes. Let's take a look at this some more. It says that we'll feel better if we just have a little bit more. But when we look around, do people with more really seem happier? Or better yet, let's look at ourselves. Hey man, listen. The people that say that money doesn't help are people that never had any. Or money isn't everything. Those are the people that never had anything. Listen, once I've been on both sides of money. I've been on no money and I had a lot of money. And I tell you this, I'd rather go through life solving problems and issues and doing life with money. We are the wealthiest nation in the world. Even those at the poverty line in America have more than 85% of the rest of the world. If this is true, why do we have so much financial fear? Guys, take a look at this. The people in America have more than 85% than everybody in the rest of the world. In other words, the worst day in America is still the best day in some countries. What a perspective. And discontentment. When it comes to money, we will never experience true, lasting contentment until we answer two questions. First, who owns the money? And second, how much is enough? It turns out that the Bible also has a lot to say about money and provides clear, simple answers to these questions. First, when I started attending church, I never thought about the Bible as an instruction manual. And I started looking at the Bible and I started unpacking some of the things. And, you know, you, you hear these Bible stories and, and, and quite frankly, growing up or quite, quite frankly, the neighbors I grew up in, church to me was a social center. It's kind of like where uh, weddings would happen and parties and quinceañeras and, and all that stuff would happen and, and people would go to the church and they would be drinking and all that stuff. So to me, church was not a significant or holy type of place or sanctuary. But when I got into the military and Brother Johnson, Brother Wade in the Navy talked to a Marine and started unpacking the Bible, it planted a seed in me. When I went to a men's breakfast hosted by my good friend, uh, Rudy Ortiz, who I then was led to the Lord, and I started seeing what the Bible had to say about money. And I was shocked to see how much wisdom and value and experience of people who've managed money or mismanaged money is actually in the Bible. See, when it comes to money, 
I don't want based my rules on today's times because today's times are flawed. I'd rather choose a value and principle base that has stood the test of time. Good market, down market, tribes, wars, peace, darkness, light, people with no clothes, people with a lot of clothes, people with no business, people with a lot of businesses, people with no land, people with a lot of land. I want to find that rule, those sets of values and principles that I can have an opportunity to create generational wealth, not only for myself, but also for multiple generations of my family last name. Because I believe I am a steward of our last name. I believe I'm a steward of our legacy. Do you? If you believe that too as well, put it in the comment section below. I am responsible for my legacy. Put it in the comment section below if you believe that. I am responsible for my legacy. Let's get back to this video. It says that God owns it all. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's yes. and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. No. Believing this means that we are merely taking care of His money, not our money. Yep. We call this stewardship. Our focus changes from what do I want to do with my money to what does God want me to do with, with His, his money. money. Yes. In fact, He uses money as a tool to shape us, as a test of trust and obedience and as a testimony to shine light into a dark world. Wow, the three T's. Money is a tool, money is a test, and money is a testimony. <laughs> oh man, this thing is preaching. Ah, I love this. Sean Turner, whoever created, who uploaded this man, let's make sure we give him some credit on this video. That was powerful. How many, be how many believe that money is a tool, money is a test, money is a testimony? I just uh, produced a video on Sunday that one of the things that God uses money for is to test you so therefore he can build your character for what for your legacy for eternity he wants to mold your character he wants to shape your mind to make an impact to let everybody know how good great god is to you and through you so therefore you can be a testimony for other people <sighs> amazing stuff here answering the second big question how much is enough is a journey leading to true contentment you see, we all have a finite financial pie of a certain size. With this pie, we can only use money in a few ways. To live, give, owe, and grow. Okay. Before using any money, we should all heed the words of Hebrews 13.5 by being content with what we have. We must choose contentment. Next, we interact with God. Don't choose contentment. Don't confuse contentment also for laziness. Like if there's an opportunity to prevent you and you're content, but there's an opportunity. I might have a challenge with this one. It said, just be content with what you have. That means relax, chill. Yeah, that, that's what uh, that is. Matter of fact, let's look up the definition of contentment. Because you also have to understand when certain words are translated. Because you remember, a Hebrew, Hebrew and Greek is the original context in some Aramaic with some of the original context of the Bible. Things get lost in translation, especially coming from those language into English, and then English into many different variations of English, King James, New King James, New International Version, New Living Translation. Things get lost in uh, translation. So contentment is defined as a state of happiness and satisfaction. So let me ask you guys a question. You got $200,000 a year, $200,000, a million dollars a year income. This is a Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel, right? Are you content with just being okay, knowing that you have a, you've been uh, stewarded and been entrusted with talent, with money, with opportunity, and you just say, I'm good. But the question you gotta ask yourself is, hey God, are you good? What would you have me do with this opportunity? What would you have me do with this million dollars in resources? What would you have me do with this real estate portfolio? What would you have me do with this insurance policy? What would you have me do with this estate? Just be content and chill and just be lazy and kick back, retire. By the way, Rabbi Lappin said that one of the things that we, he thought we would argue on because I do quote unquote, uh, uh, in my past I did retirement planning and I changed that out to financial freedom, financial independence planning, because I don't individually believe in retirement. I believe retirement planning breeds laziness and lack of willingness to continue to improve life after you have officially retired from a job or a career. Because I believe, and it's based also in the Bible in Leviticus, that you should go back to the previous generation, go back to the, early, the new and early generations, the younger generations, and go groom them and train them for the next evolution of life with your wisdom of what you learned in your life. So I'm just curious, 
What is your definition of contentment? How you define contentment in your life? Put it in the comment section below. I'm curious. Who owns the whole pie to decide how much is enough for each wedge. The pie allows us to see that there are no independent financial decisions within the pie. It reveals that if we have a long-term perspective, yes. we make better decisions Co for today. For Correct. And that's why I don't believe in get rich quick. I've seen it in 01, I've seen it in 08, 09. I'm seeing it now with Bit, Bitcoin and crypto, uh, with, with uh, NFTs. I see it with a, a lot of different things. Small capacity, large capacity, get rich quick mind, mindset mentality. If you have a long-term perspective on things, you're a little bit more discerning, a little bit more thoughtful because you understand you're entrusted with a gift. You're entrusted with money. You're entrusted with opportunity. If you blow it, you may not be entrusted with another chance. So you have to be a little bit more pragmatic in how you handle these resources. For each wedge, the Bible provides wisdom that applies all the time for any size of pie. Sure does. Spend less exactly. than you earn because every financial success depends on it. Correct. Give generously because yes. giving breaks the power money has over our lives. Avoid debt. One of the books I read from an, uh, one of the books I read from a economist who's also Jewish by background. I believe it. I think he also converted into Christianity. The name of his book: God wants you to be rich. Okay, and in one of his one of his books uh, chapters there, he says that if you don't save. If you don't give, what you're saying is, I'm so selfish that I don't even trust God, who owns everything, to give me another opportunity. And so therefore, we don't save, we don't give, because you're hoarding. And that's a problem. And that's why God can't bless. God can't bless closed hands. God can only bless open hands, surrendering to His will, His words. So therefore, you can be a testimony. I love this. Void debt, because debt always mortgages the future. Pay taxes with gratitude because they are now here, here's also a miscalculation in American business, especially with our accounting practices. Sometimes people, especially if those of you Dave Ramsey folks, uh, the Dave Ramsey fans, sometimes people say uh, uh, debt is uh, uh, is evil. Debt is bad. And, and sometimes people say, I need to be debt free, which means that I have no debt at all. No student loan debt, no credit card debt, no mortgage debt, no car loan debt, zero debt. OK, but here's a problem. Here's the reality of credit in America. You need credit. Sadly, if you don't have good credit, your car insurance premium goes up. If you don't have good credit, you can't get the apartment. If you don't have credit, you can't buy that house. If you don't have good credit, you don't get that, you know, you don't get that loan to uh, start uh, your business and expand your, your enterprise. So you need credit. Now, the other part of this is scripture says that the borrower is enslaved to the lender. Okay. But how come when I analyze financial statements of a lot of Biblically based nonprofits, religious foundations, and their tax returns. You know what I see? I see debt. And I ask, how come we don't pay off debt? You know what the accountant says? We advise them not to pay off the debt because the debt is business tax deductible. Okay? And we can always, at one pocket, pay, take money from the assets column and pay off the debt at any time. We just make sure we have more assets, liquid cash, than we have debt, and they consider themselves debt free. So, in today's day and age, also discern. Don't, by the way, just don't take my word for it. Talk to the people that help you with finance. Talk to people that help you with taxes. Talk to the people that help you with their finances. If I have $2 million and $500,000 of debt, am I considered, quote unquote, debt free? Because at any time, I could take a piece of the $2 million of liquid cash and pay off the $500,000. The downside to that is if you do that and, the, and that business interest or business debt was providing business tax deductions, well, you lose those business tax deductions and the rest of the $2 million is now exposed to taxation. So what's one of the things is you give up liquidity, but also you also give up extra money in taxation. So there's other things to think about. Talk to the people that help you with your finances to help you discern and weave through that financial conversation. They are symptomatic of God's provision. Plan for financial margin because the unexpected will happen. And to make it all work, Set long-term goals because there's always a trade-off between the short-term and the long-term. This is our stewardship journey. This journey leads us to contentment, confidence, and better communication. God's financial wisdom changes the way we think, act, and communicate about money. So let's listen to what God says about money rather than what the world says. Or what you say to yourself in your own selfish desires. It's a large part about uh, stewardship to say you're not just doing it for you. Your obedience and the willingness to work and operate on the, 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 the relationship you have with God, the things that God has inspired you to do, it's just not for you, man. 
It's for the people that you love and care about, people around you, God's people. And if you listen to that, you'll far surpass your own selfish desires. There it is. Okay, with that, oh, Ron, Ron Blue Institute. What? Indiana Wesleyan University? A college did this? Only smokes, not bad. For a college, I think more colleges today need to be talking about this type of stuff, especially all the craziness that a lot of these colleges are making our kids listen to. And uh, speaking of which, stewardship of my children's future. My kids are asking me, Bobby, do I go to college? Do I go to college? I said, listen, I've never been to college, but I've made millions and millions of dollars a year in my life through entrepreneurship and capitalism, and free enterprise, and being involved in the insurance industry. I can't tell you with my 100% conviction that college is going to change your life, especially the things that they're teaching you right now in college for the price that they're charging and the debt potentially that you're going to be enslaved to, that you owe to, based on going to college and getting student loan debt. So I don't know, babe, but uh, again, it's a conversation you need to have with your children, whether or not the trade-off is worth it. So with that being said, guys, fantastic video here. I 100% Love this video. Uh, I had a couple uh, thoughts there, uh, which I uh, tweaked with inside the video that I have uh, personal uh, reservations about. But uh, anyway, what do you think? I want to know what you have to say in the comment section below. What are your thoughts about stewardship? What are your thoughts about being ambitious? What are your thoughts about saying, I need to grow my business, I need to grow my career. I just don't want to necessarily be quote unquote content in the lazy context of the word. So I'm, I'm just curious what you got to say, put it in the comment section below. And by the way, before I let you go, check out these two interviews you did with both Rabbi Lappin, who blew my mind about stewardship, about just understanding Bible-based strategies of how the Jewish uh, approach their finances. Check out this interview right here, which is practically a portion of the Old Testament uh, if you're reading the Bible. And here's an interview I did with uh, Southern Korean immigrant Daniel Kwok, whose father was a missionary who was a pastor who relocated from South Korea into Chicago to build a church. So listen to uh, that interview I did with him too as well, our two most popular videos here on understanding money, finance based on the Bible. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can get value out of this, please like our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click subscribe and hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. That being said, guys, I'm your Money Smart Guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.